Good afternoon and welcome to our general surgery lecture series. I am Dr. Galak Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America and the Caribbean and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you'll have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located on the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Timothy Novak. His presentation is titled, Management of Rheatric Complications. Dr. Timothy Novak is a board certified general surgeon at Baptist Health, specializing in robotic and bariatric surgery. Dr. Novak focuses on patient first approach, maximizing their safety with minimal scarring and pain. He seeks to deliver the best outcomes while incorporating the latest techniques and advancements. Dr. Novak received his uh, degree from the Medical College of Georgia at Georgia Regents University in Augusta. He then completed his general sur surgery residency at Medical Center Atrium, uh, Novicent Health in Macon, Georgia, where he served as a chief resident and earned the Robotics Surgical Resident of the Year Award in 2021. Due to, due to his uh, passion for using the most up-to-date techniques and technology, he then completed a minimal invasive and bariatric surgery fellow at Baptist Health under the guidance of Anthony uh, Gonzalez, MD. Dr. Novak is a member of the American College of Surgeons, the Society of American Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgery, and the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and the Southeastern Surgical Congress. He has presented at numerous professional conferences nationally and internationally and has published articles in several medical journals. So with this, uh, please, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Timothy Novak. Dr. Novak, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Oh, wow. Thank you for that, that, that awesome introduction. Go ahead and uh, share your screen, doctor. Go in here. Let's see. I think it's going to be this one. Are you able to see it okay? Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, I'm going to go over a brief presentation today on one of my specialties here. Um, it's really going to be uh, kind of a brief overview. There's lots of things that can fortunately go wrong with bariatric surgery. A lot of them are relatively uncommon or more so benign, but I'm going to go through some of the more unfortunately, frequent things that we see, uh, how we as surgeons are managing them, as well as some of the new techniques and uh, kind of devices that we're using to do such. I'll briefly touch on um, more medical management of these as well. This is more focused on kind of new and upcoming technology that we're trying to introduce into the field of bariatric surgery and uh, post-operative management. So he already went through all this. Uh, so I don't need to say that again. I don't have any financial disclosures to talk about here, um, but here's kind of what we're gonna be talking about. I mentioned uh, really, this is focusing more on the surgical aspects of things and how we as surgeons deal with it. Uh, the main things I'm gonna go through today are leaks, be it from a gastric sleeve or a gastric bypass, uh, bleeding and hematoma formation. Usually on the, we see that more so with the sleeves, internal hernias with the gastric bypasses, um, and then even though it's becoming more of an outdated topic, we still see a lot of these gastric bands. There are some issues that can present with gastric bands. And so I want to talk about what you might see out in the wild and how you might need to deal with that as well. So just a brief overview. I'm sure we're all well aware of the obesity epidemic, but it's kind of brought on a new age of surgery and that we've now have more bariatric surgical medicine um, as well. So Obesity is just an epidemic globally. We're seeing this not only in the U.S., but everywhere else. The U.S. has kind of had a staggering and dramatic rise in obesity, unfortunately. You can see from 2017 to 2021, we actually had almost a 9% increase in adults that are technically obese. Um, and that even more, unfortunately, is we're seeing that down into adolescents and children, too. So they're starting them young and the bad habits are forming early. Um, by 2030, what we're going to see is over half of the U.S. adult population is going to be technically obese, and a quarter of which 
meet these severe obesity levels. And this comes with all sorts of problems. I don't even need to, need to dispel it anymore, but you can see these diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, you name it, it's probably related to, to obesity as well. And one of the things we don't even think about that there are certain cancers that are related to obesity. Um, namely, we see this with colon cancer, there's a pretty direct link there. So treating obesity, preventing obesity has a multitude of health benefits uh, down the line. And that's kind of where the surgical uh, usefulness in obesity medicine has come in. It's getting that severe obese patients into the obese or moderately obese categories. We see dramatic health improvements, even if you lower the BMI just a little bit. So obesity, not only medically is a bad thing, it's financially a bad thing too. It causes huge US health, or health costs um, for the US. About 20% of our entire health costs can be re related back to obesity. And that's namely just the treatment of all these underlying comorbidities that come with obesity. The workup and presentation and everything, it all, it all adds up to a lot of money. Economically, that we can have a problem too. You can have missed days of work, so you're not impacting your you know, local economy with your, your job or anything like that. And then a decreased life expectancy too. Well, there's less money back to your economy as well. So overall, there's a prediction that the obesity ec epidemic costs the U.S. about $200 billion per year to treat and manage. And that's just a staggering amount of money. So I mentioned BMI. I'm sure we're all really well familiar with this. This is how we cl classify BMI and where it becomes more useful in the medical and surgical fields in treating uh, obesity is when we look for cutoffs, um, namely a BMI of 35 and above, you're, you've become a surgical candidate for bariatric uh, procedures like the sleeve or the bypass. Below that, usually from about a BMI of 27 and above, we can treat it with medical therapies as well. You may have heard of things like Ozempic and Wagovi and Manjaro. They're all in the news right now. Those are good. They, they actually have really good responses in weight loss, um, but they're, they're more tuned for patients that are just in that obese or moderately obese categories. The severely obese are best treated surgically. They provide the best outcomes, which we'll talk about here too. So I mentioned the medical and behavioral therapies, they're, they're good. They can get up to a 15% expected body weight. You can lose that much of that 15%. Um, but compared to say a sleeve or a bypass, the number, you know, the percentage weight loss is usually about a quarter of what you can do with a surgical procedure. So bariatric surgery offers not only more weight loss, but better long-term mortality rates uh, when you compare it with the match controls there. And that is mainly due because we're, we're really affecting how the body absorbs food and how it hormonally triggers the person to eat. And if you can alter those, you get better long-term results than just say a diet and an exercise plan, which is usually a very fleeting response to, to weight loss. Um, and so you can see that number, the, the bariatric surgical numbers there, as we've seen how well it works, we're seeing huge rises in the number of surgeries that we do for obesity. Um, in 2018, these are obviously old numbers now, but almost 400,000 procedures were performed worldwide for bariatric surgeries. Uh, the majority of them now being the sleeve and the bypass. Um, here at Baptist, we're probably doing, a, I would say roughly a 70 to 30 split on sleeves to bypasses. Um, but it's really, it's tailored to the patient. There's specific reasons to do one versus the other. Neither is a bad surgery. I wouldn't, you know, say stay away from bypasses because they're scary, but they both have a, a means and a, a need in the, in the market here. Uh, but they both can have problems that can arise from them. Uh, and that's what we're going to get into today. So really, when you have complications, the number one thing is recognizing it, especially in bariatric surgery. Um, these usually present very quickly after your procedure. Um, and recognizing the signs leads to better patient outcomes. What we saw when we first do, started doing bariatric surgery was a pretty high complication rate, namely because these were majority, uh, majority being an open procedure. Um, we didn't start doing a whole lot of laparoscopic and robotic bari bariatric surgery until like the late uh, 2000s. Um, so you can see that 40% complication rate was reported back in 2001. Uh, as we got more you know, experience doing these procedures. And as time went on and we converted more towards the laparoscopic and robotic approaches, that complication rate dropped dramatically. And it's down 20% or so in 2018. 
And 20% stealth sounds high, but that really does include anything that can go wrong. And that's that's the surgical site infections at the skin, that's readmissions to the ER, that, that's not just your extreme uh, complications like I mentioned in the outline we're gonna talk about, that's really anything. The major complication rate, say for like a leak, is about 2%. For a bleed, about 4%. You know, they're low. It's still a good percentage number, but it's not like the 20 that I'm saying here in a very dramatic number. Um, the problem with complications in bariatric patients is they can happen at any time and any place. Um, a lot of patients travel to get their bariatric surgery done somewhere, then return somewhere else. And the physician that sees them when they get the complication, they're brand new to the patient, you know, brand new to the experience. They don't even know about what history and surgical history they have. Um, so it's always good to have a basic understanding of what to look for, what your patient has had done, um, and then a basic understanding of how you, you know, as a physician, can help treat it at the same time. So here's a kind of a rundown. Um, the way I break down complications is kind of in a time frame. I look mainly at uh, early, late, and somewhere in the middle. I'll call it a medium here. Early complications are usually a technical problem, something that's gone wrong with the surgery. Um, number one there I see is a bleeding and a leak. I mentioned the percentages earlier. Um, these are usually just due to errors with the, the, the technique when you're coming across with the stapling device or sometimes you just don't dissect well enough, but they can have catastrophic consequences, especially if they're left uncaught. Uh, other things like necrosis of the omentum can happen. Some of these are found incidentally. You know, we, patient comes in for a completely different thing. We find that there's some stranding of the omentum near where your resection was during the bypass. Do you need to do anything about it? Not necessarily, but it gets called as a complication as well. Uh, medium time frame. Things like splenic abscesses or even just abscesses at the surgical sites where we came in with the, the trocar so this procedures can happen. Uh, hematomas, again, you can still have that bleeding uh, in the medium time range. And then late complications, things like fistula formation, especially with the bypass, the gastrogastric fistulas um, are, are, can happen, rare, but can. Uh, things like internal hernias, which we'll talk about, uh, we'll kind of go through the hallmarks of those and what we need to do about it. For sleeves, things like sleeve stenosis can happen, um, and more infrequently, almost rare now these days, there's problems with the band, and we'll talk about band slippage and band erosion and how we how we deal with those too. So here's just some generic pictures here. I mentioned the splenic abscesses, little uh, collections near the spleen. You can drain these off if they become a problem. Sleeve stenosis, just that narrowing down best treated probably with a conversion to a ruin Y. You're never going to be able to open that thing back up. And the sleeve leak, we'll talk about that first. So a gastric leak here. This is a CT image. This is a patient with a gastric sleeve. What you can see here is the little bit of a remnant of a stomach left. And as uh, this is in a um, basically a, an axial orientation. And right here, you see this white line. That's actually the staples that are used to create the to create the sleeve all the way down the stomach, forming like a banana-like shape. Right next to it is a fluid collection, an air fluid collection. This is actually a large abscess after a leak. Um, the majority of these leaks actually happen near the top of the stomach, where we, where we do the first bit of the staple line at the, the angle of hiss. Um, but they can become a major problem. Uh, so the leak rate, like I mentioned, is pretty low. It's about 1%, up to 1.5 in some literature. Uh, it gets very high when you do a revisional surgery, uh, mainly because there's just a lot of scar tissue there from the previous surgery. That, that dissection along the angle of his becomes a lot more difficult. And um, you're basically, I wouldn't say firing blind when you're doing some of these stapling devices, but it can become more of an issue and you're not getting nearly as good of tissue either. Um, I mentioned before the causes of it is usually a technical issue when you're when you're getting a, a leak on a first surgery patient, a brand new surgical patient. Um, up near the angle of hiss is the the normal area. It happens. It's hard to fire a stapler up there. It's very difficult to dissect up there cleanly. The robot makes it so much easier, but it is very challenging to do still. Um, it's also doesn't have the of the area that has blood supply, it's probably the least around the stomach there, especially once you've done your dissection. And then the number one cause, it's a, it's a very high pressure system. 
Um, there's two sphincters, you know, the pylorus and the gastroesophageal junction, that sphincter there, it forms basically a container of pressure. And where does it blow? Usually it's up near the angle of his. Uh, so that's normally where we see most leaks happen from. And the first thing you're going to see on a leak patient is tachycardia. So if you've got a day zero gastric sleeve patient and they're mildly tachycardic, I'm talking 110 heart rate or above, investigate it further. Uh, it is a leak until proven otherwise. Uh, if you have somebody with fever after your surgery and going inside with tachycardia, almost certainly it's, it's related to your procedure. This mandates an abdominal CT. Um, if they can get an upper gastrographin study, that'd be even better because then we can see where the contrast is pooling. And what we're looking for, not only is the leak of contrast, but to see if the leak is contained or not. If this is a free leak, it's probably not going to um, heal on its own and the patient's going to get sicker and sicker. If you can't find anything and you still have a high suspicion, uh, dropping an endoscope is also a good option. It's very difficult to see a sleeve leak internally, uh, especially a fresh sleeve uh, leak, unless the hole is very big. Um, so usually the upper GI with contrast is going to be your best answer. Or CT or upper GI contrast is your best answer. Um, that tachycardia is very specific um, for and very sensitive. Or I would say very specific uh, for, a, for a sleeve leak, especially when you get up into the upper ranges of it. Now, how we treat these really depends on the patient's clinical status. So this is a nice little algorithm. It's a little busy, but it, what you're seeing here is the first thing you need to look at is your patient's condition. If they're stable, we've got time. We can work this thing up a bit more. We can get our information and we can come up with sometimes even less invasive options. Well, I'll jump first to the unstable one. Doesn't even matter. They're unstable. We're going back in. We're going to put a camera in the belly. I usually start laparoscopic when I have a, sleep, a fresh sleeve leak. And we're going to look for that, that extravasation that we'll usually see some gastric contents pooling over there. And at the same time, I usually use an endoscope. That way I can insufflate some air into the sleeve while I've got the, uh, the actual sleeve under some saline in the, in the belly. And I can see the bubbling of air coming through it. If the tissue is healthy, which usually isn't at that point, you can try and repair it with some suture. Usually the answer though is you just drain it. Put some drains in there, clear the infection, get the unstable patient out of the operating room and live to fight another day. Now jumping back to more of the stable side, if you see that the, the leak is more contained, uh, we can have options to try and drain it with you like an interventional radiology method percutaneous drainage. Sometimes you can even just leave them NPO, give them uh, parenteral, nu or, um, yeah, parenteral nutrition and some antibiotics, repeating the studies to see if this thing heals on its own. Other options like endoscopic management we're going to try and get into as well today. They're good options. Um, they're, they have a good clinical success rate, somewhere in the 70% range. I'm trying to close leaks, um, but they can be a little difficult to perform and a little uncomfortable too. So as I mentioned before, the main principle with a gastric leak is patient stability here. So if, it, if, if you're trying to control the leak, that really helps improve their stability. Antibiotics, finding the, deficit, uh, the defect, controlling the contamination is huge here. When you're in the surgery to try and control that contamination, yes and no to putting in like a J tube, a J feeding tube. Um, if you think this is gonna be a major hole, a major leak, this patient's not gonna be eating for weeks, some months on end, to try and heal this thing, now's the time to probably put it in. You don't really want to get back in that belly again unless you have to. Um, the flip side of all this, if you had that high suspicion for a leak, the patient seemed unstable, you went to the OR and you can't find anything, that's fine. It's like a, I, I compare it to going in for an appendix and it not being appendicitis. It is better to go in there and miss this and, than it is to miss the diagnosis originally. Um, but these things can take a long time to heal, especially if you don't get the wide drainage done initially. Uh, I mentioned the reoperation and debridement. You can see the, the top there is really where this thing is leaking from, that little wisp of contrast that's coming out right there freely. Other things, endoscopic management, stents and drains are really the go-to right now. Clips are very difficult to place. Um, usually the tissue needs to be very healthy, which it's normally not. 
and the, the the actual defect needs to be pretty small to get a clip across it. And some of these defects can be pretty big, up to like a centimeter across. Uh, if you have a skilled endoscopist, overstitching is okay as well. Again, you need really good tissue to kind of grab and sew onto that. Uh, one of the new emerging technologies is, is actually doing like a wound vac into the actual sleeve and creating that negative pressure. It actually has really good results. It's difficult to place. It's really a brand new, um, you know, in its infancy on a uh, number of people doing it. Uh, but it's interesting to talk about. I'll show some pictures of that. So stents have kind of become the mainstay. Um, they're good and bad. They work really well. They have a clinical success rate of about 76% or so, depending on the size of the leak. Um, they're a good choice for your initial treatment if you can if you have this, this leak of contrast up top. What you can see though is that it's kind of hard to place these things. They can migrate uh, as the stomach and the esophagus peristalsis, so it's really difficult to get them to stay put. Um, you can see it's half in the esophagus, half down in the stomach, so that can be pretty annoying for the patients. It's actually really uncomfortable to have these things in place. Um, but they work and it's an endoscopic means. So you're really not getting back into that hard to operate abdomen. Uh, so it's good for non-surgical candidates. Um, I mentioned they can migrate and that's up to 30% of these stents will move around. So if you find that your hole is not closing when you do a repeat endoscopy, it's probably because your stent moved and you're gonna have to get your GI guy to move that stent to back where it was or place a second stent on top of it. And then the higher and higher you go up the esophagus, the more uncomfortable these get. They're, like I said, they're very uncomfortable for patients to have. I, patients with the stents, they are always nauseous because that feeling of just irritation at the lower uh, esophagus is, is too much for them. Um, and it takes a long time. It takes like six weeks to fully heal with a stent. Um, but, you know, it's got good results. I mentioned the other options there. If you go back in and do some surgery to try and clean all this up. We can try and sew it. We can try and put a flap on top of it. Normally, it's very hard to identify the actual hole where this is all coming from, and the tissue is just trash. Uh, so there's really nothing to sew to, nothing to place. The answer really is normally just drainage. Um, but you can see there are some good success rates otherwise. One of the things that we're really doing a whole lot near now here at uh, Baptist with our patients is these double pig or double J pigtail stents and drains. It literally just looks like a little figure eight with two little whole, uh, wings on it. One end goes into the abscess cavity where the leak form. The other end sits inside the stomach. All you're doing is creating a passageway for all the, the nastiness in that abscess cavity to drain out. That actually causes the abscess cavity to shrink quicker. Uh, so we get really good results with that. The double J portion of it keeps it in place too. So it doesn't like to migrate. Um, it's kind of tricky to place them. So a skilled endoscopist is usually required for these, um, but they work. So the endoluminal evacs, the vacuums, a uh, pretty interesting idea. Um, I could see how it could be a little uncomfortable for the patients. I've never personally placed these ones, but they, they seem intriguing to me. They're good for um, really anywhere on the sleeve where you have a leak, but they're good up top too. The goal here is to actually get the foam into the abscess cavity um, next to the sleeve leak using an endoscopic route. So the foam is actually inside your the, the lumen. The way you place these things, you actually take an NG tube through the nose, bring it out the mouth, attach a piece of black foam on top of it, and then snake it back down with the endoscope. You're going to push it into the abscess cavity and you'll leave it there and you hook it up to a wound vac suction. You change it every four days or so. And every time you change it, you go back in there with the scope and you look at it to see is that abscess getting smaller. And then what these guys saw was that, yeah, it works. The abscess cavity got much smaller, much faster, usually in the span of a couple of weeks. The only problem with it is it's very tough to place it. Um, it's uncomfortable to have an NG tube for that long a duration as well. Um, and every time they had to do it, these guys did it all under general anesthesia. So now you're taking up an operating trip every four days just to change a wound vac, and that can be a little burdensome as well. All right, so changing gears now. Uh, staple line bleeding, one of the more common major complications after uh, a bariatric procedure. We see it with both the bypasses and the sleeves. 
uh, and hematoma formation, they go one hand in hand. You can see it's just a giant hematoma that's formed next to the, the stomach and staple line. Well, like I said, one of the more frequent ones. Um, the bypass, somewhere around 2 to 3% of the time, it can happen. Usually these happen in the, it's a technical problem that happens up front. Um, we normally catch it intra-op. Um, that's when we can apply clips and sealants and things to it. But oftentimes the patient's under some anesthesia, their blood pressure is lower. You know, when they wake up, their blood pressure spikes, their pain hits, and that's when we start to get the bleeding afterwards. So even though you were dry during the case, well, now it's bleeding now. Um, I mentioned hypertension uh, previously going into the surgery is a risk factor to it. The more of these you do, the more technique you have, the less bleeding chances you get though. Uh, so how do we deal with it? So basically the symptoms you're looking out for are that tachycardia again, but this time you're going to see obviously the drop in hemoglobin that goes or lighter on with it. Uh, what I found more commonly is these patients, they, they just feel fatigued in the morning. Uh, they don't want to get up and walk around. We encourage all our bariatric patients to start walking around the floors day zero. Um, if you walk in the room the next morning, they say, no, I haven't gotten out of bed. I'm just too tired. Uh, and you check their heart when it's up and check some labs that day uh, and just look out for a little bit of a bleed. If you're suspicious of it, if you see that good decrease in hemoglo hemoglobin, uh, not only get the labs, obviously, but get a CT with IV contrast. What you're looking for is not only the hematoma, but you want to see if it's actively bleeding. Um, if it really, if it is, and it's a fresh surgical patient, uh, you know, you've got the options of going back in there and fixing yourself maybe getting radiology to, you know, coil that area uh, or just letting it ride. Sometimes these things will stop bleeding on its own. If it's actively bleeding, it's probably not going to stop. Uh, and that's when you probably need to act on it. Like I said, they typically self-resolve though. And I've seen large hematomas there. You just leave it be. Unless it's causing a problem, like it's infected or it's pushing on the, on the stomach or the pouch uh, and causing some sort of outflow obstruction, just leave it be. The, the body will resorb it. If the patient's unstable, jumping all the way back to that flow chart, well, that's when we act on it. Really, the, the mainstay treatments here are reversal of coagulopathy and transfusion as necessary. And if it just means hitting them with blood until they stop bleeding, then, that, then that's the case. But once they deteriorate, no, we got to act and change our plan. Uh, internal hernia. This is one of the bigger things we worry about with our gastric bypass patients. They've got quite a few call signs. Um, but they can also present very insidiously. Um, it's kind of gnawing abdominal pain for weeks or months on time. It might just be written off as an ulcer that's formed at the anastomosis or just some GI bug. Always think in the back of your head, this is an internal hernia if you have a bypass patient with chronic abdominal pain. Um, this CT here, we'll go into a little bit better picture here in a second. This is that hurricane, that swirl sign of the mesentery. This is the number one CT finding you'll see for an internal hernia. This patient, unfortunately, can see all this edema and the mesenteric straining. This, this one had a, a bad outcome. This was bad, dead bowel in this case. Um, but small bowel obstructions in general can occur at any point during a, a, a patient's recovery and post-operative management after a bypass. Lifetime risk up to almost 10%. That's huge for these patients. Uh, and that includes just regular small bowel obstructions, i.e. adhesive disease, uh, like we see with every other surgical patient, or the more dreaded internal hernias as well. Uh, normally, these are early a technical issue. If you have an obstruction on day one, it's unlikely to be an internal hernia. It's more likely that you kink the anastomosis at the JJ, um, you know, something like that, a port, a port hernia, something like that. Um, later on, more likely adhesions, 14% of the time. And the literature is right now saying a late internal hernia formation, that accounts to about 54% of all small bowel obstructions in the, in the bypass patients. So where do you form these? Um, this diagram is based on what we call a retrocolic uh, approach for a gastric bypass. You can see the limb that heads up towards the stomach pouch passes through the transverse colon mesentery. We make a little defect there. I don't perform retrocolic approaches. I do an uh, anti-colic approach. So this defect for me doesn't even exist. Um, but this is a possibility for patients that have had a retrocolic anastomosis form to have a piece of bowel stick up through that hernia defect and get stuck there. Um, the classic one is called Peterson's uh, defect. 
it's between where your root limb mesentery and the transverse mesocolon kind of pushes that little knuckle of bowel through. And I've got a picture of that one here in a second. Um, and then the actual, the most common one that I see isn't a Peterson's, it's the, the it's a herniation right around the JJ, the jejunodejunion anastomosis here. Anytime you're manipulating the bowel and you bring that mesentery over, it folds like a fan and it creates a, a, a pseudo defect right there. It's not necessarily a hole. It's just kind of um, a piece of the tissue on top of each other that form this little bridge and things get pushed through it and stuck there. So there's seven classic signs that we see on CAT scans when, you, when you're looking for an internal hernia. Um, the usefulness of them varies with the number one most useful being that hurricane or swirl sign. It's classic. You'll see that nice swirling image as you're scrolling up and down through the axials. It looks like that rotation of a hurricane on the radar maps. Um, other things like the tubular mesentery, a little rare. I didn't include a picture of that one. The ones that we see as more pathognomonic are number six here, the small bowel that passes posterior to SMA that's not the duodenum. You can see that bowel kind of swooping under the, the SMA there or the right-sided jejuno-jejuno anastomosis. Normally, you'll see that staple line over here on a CAT scan on an axial image. If you see it rotated way over right of the midline, that's a problem. Um, that's usually an internal hernia. Um, they can be very difficult to see, though. So if you don't get that classic swirl sign, you're probably not going to pick it up yourself. This is really left in the hands of more experienced radiologists. A swirl sign is a very good predictor, though. It has a high sensitivity. Some literature says it has a 100% sensitivity if you got a good reader uh, to read your images or if you can see it yourself. It's also pretty specific, uh, up to 90% of the time. If you see a swirl, it is an internal hernia. Um, so the question then when, when we're doing the procedures is should we close these defects? Um, where I trained here, they don't close them. Uh, the thought is if it's less than a 5% risk, then it just isn't worth it. But I think there's pros and cons to that. I personally close all my defects. Um, it takes two minutes to do, and you, you, you decrease the rate of internal hernia formation from about 10 to 6%, 10 to 5%, uh, like we're seeing in this literature here. Um, it can... Um, like I said, it's pretty quick to do. You just take a non-absorbable suture. It's usually like an ethabon or something like that. Some people use a stratifix and you just close the little defect. Here's a picture of it right here. So this is the Peterson's defect here. And it's just the, the swoop of mesentery here on the transverse colon, the swoop of mesentery from the, the rule limb. You just bring that together. The problem is you are sewing on mesentery. So you want to take little tiny bites to bring these things together. That way you don't restrict the blood flow. These things can bleed when you're doing it too. I guess that's probably one fear of why our guys here don't do it is they just don't want to risk the bleeding. Um, but personally, I close every single one of these. Um, so if you've got a patient that comes in the middle of the night with the internal hernia on CT, small bowel obstruction signs, again, we go off clinically, you know, is this an emergency or can we have, do we have some time to decompress the patient? So when I see them and if I've got the ability, I usually place an NG tube for decompression, you know, there's pluses and minuses in doing that for a bariatric bypass patient, whether or not that NG tube will work a whole lot, um, but it doesn't hurt either. So I usually place it just to decompress the bowel some. The name say here, or the name of the game here is to re de um, reduce the hernia contents out of the internal hernia defect, and that's a surgical issue. So you want to get in there. I usually do most of these laparoscopically. If I have access to the robot in the middle of the night when these usually come in, then I'll do it robotically. Um, but you just run the bowel backwards. I usually start at the cecum and run the small bowel backwards. I find the JJ anastomosis first. Like I said, nine times out of 10, that's where I find my internal hernias uh, most often. And that's where you'll see the kind of the bowel just looped underneath itself weird. Reduce the contents out of the internal hernia defect after you kind of identified your anatomy on these bypass patients. Um, the other night I had one that was, uh, you know, um, ischemic and necrotic. So resect the dead bowel at the time at the same time um, and then put it all back together. Unfortunately, like I said, some of these can hurt, happen right at the anastomosis. I've seen them become ischemic at the JJ anastomosis where we had to revise that too. At the same time, it is possible. That's, that's unfortunate if you have to deal with that in the middle of the night. Um, but otherwise, it's just reducing the contents. If the bowel looks good, then you close up that hole. 
Um, it's quick, it's easy. The whole surgery takes about 45 minutes if it all goes right. Um, afterwards, the patient feels immediately better. Their pain is almost gone. The bowel obstruction is usually resolved too. So they progress pretty quickly. I usually keep the patient in PO after the procedure. I'll start them on clear liquids, the day zero, day one, just as they're progressing, really just watching the return of bowel function at that point. Um, so gastric bands, like I said, it's a little bit of a, a history book item now. I don't per personally put gastric bands in. We haven't put a gastric band in in our facility in many years, but we've taken quite a few of them out and we still do a lot of band to bypass conversions, band to sleeve conversions as well. Uh, what you can see over here is a gastric band that is in the wrong spot. Uh, this is a slipped band. It's, it's in the wrong angle. And I'll show you a picture of what a right one should look like. So the gastric band, has been around for actually a while. Uh, there's only one that's device that's still FDA approved here in the United States, and that's the lap band. We used to have the Realize band, but they took that off the market um, back in 2016. So it comes in a few sizes. The, they fill up uh, up to about 14 cc's of volume. Patients usually have no idea how much volume they have in their band at the time when they walk into you. The band is usually manipulated so much, and maybe the last time they actually had it manipulated was a decade ago, so they never know how much is in there. Um, but the, the, the thought process is you inject saline through this little port here, which sits in the subcutaneous space. It goes into the cuff, and it fills these little balloons. And as those balloons fill up, it creates a, um, a restrictive defect on the top of the stomach, and it forms this little pouch here. Um, so the idea for the weight loss was purely restrictive. You wouldn't eat as much. Uh, yes and no. Patients found a way to eat around it. Um, you could basically eat more liquids, milkshakes, and ice creams, and all well, that goes right on through the band, and you gain weight still. Um, so they caused weight loss for some. Most people didn't have any good results, and so we started taking a lot of these back out. And then on top of it, it's a foreign body. It's a foreign body sitting right on the stomach. So we started seeing some issues long-term uh, with things like erosion, uh, and we'll talk about that. So positioning, when these things got originally placed, we look for what's called the phi angle. Uh, it's a, basically you take up the spinous processes on an X-ray and you draw a line straight on through the band. You want this to be about 50 or so degrees. I normally say 45 degrees, but it can vary. It can be as, as tight an angle as up to four or down to 58 degrees, but that's the angle you want it to be. If you saw that original, you know, x-ray here. Oh, that's not even close. It's our, it's rotated all the way around. So that's a slip band. Um, but th these things had all sorts of complications that can come up with them. The big ones we saw were erosions and slippages. You can have just minor ulcerations on the outside that cause some bleeding as well. Um, the port can have issues too. The port could flip over on itself where you can't access the, 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 the draw site. Um, you can get infections. The problem with that is that infection then travels down the tube towards the stomach, um, and you can have leak from both the port, the tubing, and the connection to the band itself. And then on top of that, you get all the, the non-device problems that can happen to bleeding, infection, PE. So gastric band erosion. Uh, you have a patient that has a gastric band that comes in, in the middle of the night uh, with pain, usually it's pain, tachycardia, those, all those infection signs. And sometimes it'll even show you some redness at the port side. That infection has traveled from the stomach all the way down the tubing the other way towards the port. Um, what you're going to look for on the CAT scan is usually some air around the actual tubing and band device. Uh, that's basically showing you that it's eroding into the, the, the hollow viscous of the lumen of the, of the stomach. And that's where the air is going to be coming from. It's pretty rare. This is, you know, 1% uh, of all bands have a, an erosion problem. It's not common. Most of them are minor erosions. Um, it's very rare that you get this, the full erosion. And the other thing, it's a very chronic problem. This is not something that happens overnight. This thing has been going on for months to years, slowly eroding into the stomach. Um, so a lot of these patients come in incidentally, they had no idea they even had a, you know, problem with their band and we see the air or we see the band sticking in the lumen of the stomach on the CT images for a completely different issue. So how do we deal with it? Um, if you get the problem of the band erosion, kind of address the patient's stability again. If they're unstable, the, you got to get the thing out. Uh, the bands form a, a capsule of inflammatory tissue around them. 
usually when you go in laparoscopically, you can see that bulge where the buckle of the band, that plastic band is, and you can actually cauterize right on top of that plastic and expose the band. Uh, you can then cut the plastic and then the band usually will just slip out. Sometimes it'll uh, out of that cavity around the stomach. Sometimes it, there's some resistance because that capsule is pretty firm. You just keep dissecting all the way around, you'll get it out. Um, then the question is if it's partially eroded and you've got you know this, this hole in the stomach, what do you do? You can try and close over that area with some suture. Usually that tissue is very friable. It doesn't hold on to suture, but the best you can, you try and, you try and layer closure it in two layers. Uh, some people will place a, um, like a patch, like a nomental patch or something up near there if you can reach the momentum or buttress the repair even. Uh, really the best thing you can do is drain it. Just get wide drainage around it. That way you're controlling the infection. Uh, and if you do have a leak postoperatively, well, great, it's a now a controlled leak, and we can just let it heal like we did with the sleeve leaks before. Um, it's always good intraoperatively to do an EGD, too. That's going to tell you if you're, you've got that air bubbling or leak. It'll actually help you get it out sometimes, too. Um, if the patient is stable, uh, these things can actually be observed. Um, it's a slow, chronic process. So as the thing is eroding into the stomach, it's actually on the outside forming that scar tissue that's coming, following right behind it. So I've seen these things fully erode into the stomach. 100% of the band is in the stomach with no, no external de uh, defect, no air leak, no nothing. And then you just retrieve the band out. So there's some thought of, can I just take these things out endoscopically? And yeah, you can. You can actually go in there, grab the device and pull it out. And you'll, you sometimes have no problems. More commonly, what we're doing is a hybrid approach where we're watching laparoscopically while we're doing this. That way we've got the option to dissect if we need it while we're also trying to retrieve it endoscopically. So in summary, that's a lot of complications. This is, like I said, a more of a surgical management, how I deal with things, the problems that I'm seeing. But really, the, the number one takeaway here is prompt recognition of the problem. Always look at your patient, see how they're clinically doing, work up the problem with CT laboratory findings, and, and, then, and then act upon it. Um, I know a lot of you know, you know guys listening in, you might not be at a bariatric center, you might not feel comfortable doing bariatric surgery. Well, a lot of the things I just discussed with you really could be handled by a general surgeon. You don't necessarily have to tr transfer these patients out emergently. Bleeding is just like bleeding anywhere else. Control the bleeding. If you have a leak, if you want to stabilize the patient with washing them out, that's the exact same thing I'm going to do when they get to a bariatric surgical center or two. Internal hernias, they probably can't wait to be transferred. You know, if you've got dead bowel, that's got to be acted on now. Really, it's about stabilizing the patient. And once you do that, get it to a, a bariatric center as fast as you can. That's totally fine. Um, and then once it gets to me, the best thing to do is it's a multidisciplinary approach. It's myself, the infectious disease doctors, the GI team. We're all working together to address this problem. And it can be a big, um, unfortunately, burdensome problem for these patients for a long time. Um, so with that, I have some references and I'll, I'll take any questions. But thank you for your time and thanks for listening in. Thank you so very much, Dr. Nowak. Um, wow, uh, this is uh, actually remarkable. Um, the pearls that you have shared with us, uh, especially from uh, the expertise that you guys have uh, acquired over the years and the way the procedure has changed over the past uh, years. Um, many things uh, jump immediately uh, to mind and it is uh, the alarming statistics that you shared with us initially. Uh, especially comparing to where we were in 2021 at 42.4%, I believe you mentioned in the U.S., and the expected rate that we're going to be at in 2030, which is 50% of the adults will be obese at some point, and morbidly obese, which is even worse, it's at 25%. So this is a major, major public health uh, issue, and I believe, and I understand, and I know that every single physician on in the line understands that obesity in each individual country is a major, major factor and contributing factor for many of the diseases that you also shared with us. It's it's outstanding, uh, and and the other um, compelling argument here is that how are we to actually not understand? Uh, that uh, there is a way to actually deal with obesity, either by nutrition or 
or, or by the medications you mentioned that currently are used for diabetics. Uh, but um, the cost that we're putting and the burden that we're putting on our country uh, because of this particular condition is simply mind boggling. $200 billion. That is, uh, wow, that is not something to take lightly. And then we have the DAOs, right? The disability adjusted life years that uh, we have to actually put up with and deal with because those are consequences of this particular condition. Um, obviously, uh, we're focusing today on the complications of the bariatric surgery, but I must mention that uh, I, I honestly relief be simply because uh, we are a center of excellence for bariatric and robotic surgery. And you have a battalion of phenomenal physicians such as yourself uh, to hear that uh, the complication has decreased from 2001, from 40% to actually 20% in 2018, that is quite remarkable. That is absolutely remarkable. One thing that uh, also comes to mind, Dr. Uh, Nork, it's the fact that uh, some of these patients that get these bariatric surgeries um, tend to flock in because of major complications that require a revision. And that is perhaps one of the biggest um, hurdles and you mentioned something extremely important. You already have to deal with a, 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 uh, a, like if you were in a dark room, you don't know how that original surgery was. And now you have to deal with just the consequence of actually fixing something that you don't know how to navigate. So I, I completely understand when surgeons or our bariatric surgeons defer to other institutions simply because they don't understand or know exactly what uh, they're going to be um, exposing themselves to or the patient. Uh, but uh, we have two questions before we continue. We have a question from Dr. Lewis and she says, uh, can you speak uh, on hiatal hernia development or esophageal spasms specifically following the uh, VSG? Uh, so hiatal hernias following a VSG. So, you know, I don't know what the rate of the development after you get, you know, after you go undergo a sleeve on developing a, a hiatal hernia. I will say that we always fix our hiatal hernias at the time of doing a VSG. Um, you know, a lot of patients will develop reflux after a sleeve if they have a hiatal hernia still in place. So I always repair that whenever I see it. Um, you know, if you have a hiatal hernia afterward and you start developing problems with it, you can still go back in there and fix it. But I don't know the rate specifically of how often they form. Mm. And uh, Jacqueline Frazier is uh, wondering, would you recommend getting a second surgery? And if if what happens? I'm sorry. Uh, it's, uh, it was just uh, left. So, I mean, if you get a second surgery, as in, let's say you've got the a sleeve already, you don't do well with it. Mm -hmm. uh, would you recommend a second surgery to, let's say, first of all, revise the sleeve? Uh, what we're seeing right now with revisions of the sleeve is you're going to have that exact same little pattern of, yeah, you drop some weight, but then you regain it again. Uh, the stomach, what's happening is you're you're just redilating your sleeve out, and then it gets back up to the point where you feel like you're not getting satiated when you eat and you gain weight again. We can keep narrowing that sleeve down over and over, but if you're not changing your habits on how we're eating, you're going to get the same problem. So the data right now for sleeve revision is not great in terms of long-term weight loss, um, especially compounded with the fact that you're going to have more problems when we go back in there. Technically, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Patients do request it pretty frequently because they're, I hate to say it, they're desperate. They're desperate for, for answers. And so I will offer sleeve revisions. What I normally suggest if you have a sleeve is that we actually convert it to a bypass. Um, the long-term weight loss results for bypasses are better. I can control how much you know length on each limb and the actual size of the pouch a little bit better than with a sleeve. Um, and they just work a little bit better long-term. So a second surgery, would I revise a sleeve? And it's not a great option. Would I convert over to a, a bypass? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a decent option if you want more weight loss after your first procedure. Which is definitely a more dramatic approach to what the original was. Um, and then uh, we have another question from uh, Harold Cordoban. It says, uh, some considerations to prevent obesity uh, with prevention and education? Oh, always a great option. 
uh, weight loss and obesity management is a team approach. Um, an ideal bariatric center not only just has your surgeon or your medical your medical director, but also has a nutritionist, has a, a, a PA that follows you, a clinical coordinator. We refer out to sleep study management, to psychiatrists to help with uh, you know, the depression that comes along with, with weight gain and obesity. It's a team approach. So if we can attack it before you get to the severely obese stage, oh, way better outcomes long-term. So for sure, you know, treating obesity ahead of time before you even get to the OR, definitely a better answer. And, and also we should point out the fact that we still practice what we already uh, understand to be a good practice, uh, if I may. Uh, and it's the fact that uh, we um, get an interdisciplinary team to actually acknowledge that the, uh, for uh, as a fact that uh, the patient really is a candidate for a bariatric surgery, because obviously the complications sometimes outweigh uh, the benefits and, and, uh, and that's what we're talking about today. Uh, so uh, what's your recommendation to avoid gastric leak and gastric sleep procedures? Uh, the recommendation is, it, it, I said, it's hard to say initially because when you're doing the surgery, nobody nobody finishes the procedure and said, well, I just screwed up. You know, you don't want ever want to leave the, the OR like that. So it's really mm -hmm. a meticulous dissection, a meticulous slow dissection of the angle of hiss. That's the number one area it's going to leak. If you can get up and find that cruise when you're dissecting, nice and slow, get through those planes, try and avoid taking as many vessels as you can, staying away from the spleen. You're gonna get better outcomes. You're gonna get better staple firing. And the second thing is you don't wanna angulate too much towards the esophagus. You gotta leave that little dog here. That's gonna act like a pressure relief check valve. Um, you know, you've got that little bit of extra tissue um, and it's not gonna cause that constriction and build up a pressure there. So if you can dissect well and angulate your staples right, you won't have you know, knock on wood, you won't have problems with it, um, but you're going to decrease your chances. Mm. Uh, Dr. Nowak, I, 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 if I recall correctly, you did uh, speak about um, um, the actual gastric leak and, and second surgeries. You mentioned that there was a 35% uh, in risk. Uh, for it to occur, you mean uh, the gastric leak? That is well, because, because that if we're trying to re-narrow a sleeve down, you still got to do that exact same dissection up towards the hiatus, and it becomes much more difficult once it's been dissected once before. The yeah. tissue planes aren't there anymore. Yeah. So you're kind of fumbling around to try and find it. That's correct. Um, and you know what? One thing that you mentioned, which is uh, obviously an amazing thing to also share with our uh, student doctors, and it's the fact that. Uh, Tachycardia is almost always, uh, it should be considered as a suspect in, in cause of, of an actual leak. I love that. Uh, and, uh, and, and the fact that uh, they really need to look into when they get these patients in the emergency room with tachycardia uh, to always think of a possibility of, uh, of, of a leak. So uh, Jacqueline Fraser is back and she says, I had a sleep bypass around uh, about 10 years ago, and I was told my stomach has started to stretch. Is that possible? Yeah, it is. The, the pouch can dilate again. Um, that reservoir gets bigger, and so you don't get that satiety feeling. So one of the things we can, after a bypass, do is narrow down the pouch again. It's the exact same kind of situation with the sleeve. All we're doing is just shrinking it down. Can it open back up and dilate more again? Absolutely. Um, so it'll help some, it'll help you lose, kind of kickstart that weight loss again, but it's all about post-operative management and kind of lifestyle changes. You, you got to keep with the strict bariatric diet afterward. It's just going to happen again. Fantastic. Well, you know what, uh, this is such a fascinating uh, topic and it keeps evolving. Every time we invite a bariatric surgeon, uh, we tend to learn uh, more and more. Uh, I remember in you know, with uh, your peers when they started uh, talking about uh, the sleeve and the different type of bariatric surgeries that you guys uh, perform, uh, how fascinating uh, that um, this has evolved in such a fascinating way, it's fascinating way uh, that is, it's just remarkable. Uh, and one last lesson, obviously, the prompt recognition of the symptoms and the problems is what uh, is going to help you as a surgeon uh, identify a way of actually helping these patients. And of course, those doctors that uh, see these patients. You know what, Dr. Nowak, we can have you uh, for several hours talking about this uh, since uh, we're all so curious, but uh, we want to be considerate to you. 
And on behalf of our entire team at Baptist International, we'd like to thank you for your presentation today, for accepting our invitation. No, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And to all of you for uh, participating today and for your great questions. If you do have any additional ones that you'd like uh, for us to uh, explore with Dr. Nowak, please let us know. If you'd like a consult with him or you'd like to learn more about, about our bariatric surgery program at Baptist, uh, please don't hesitate to actually write to us at BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. We will make sure to forward those questions to Dr. Nowak uh, and, uh, and his team so he could respond back to you. We look forward to seeing you all in our next uh, general surgery lecture series. Uh, we still haven't scheduled that, but uh, shortly you will get uh, an invitation. Thank you once again and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Nowak.